Testing one, two, three. Hey, Dog Nation, I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. Fun show coming up for you. It's Terrence Edwards stopping by later on. We'll talk to him about some of the things that have been going on with UGA wide receivers and the recruiting trail as of late. We'll even have some interesting stuff on that on the very top of today's program. And for a couple of minutes at least, I want to talk about what I think of as one pretty big difference between... The two teams that will open the 2021 season against each other. Obviously, Georgia-Clemson, a game that we're hyping up pretty much nonstop these days with good reason. Yet, there's a very, very different path that I believe that both these teams will travel after that game. So, we'll talk about all that coming up here in just a moment. It is Dog Nation Daily, daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Meriwether and Tharp, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So, some days we start the show making a really big point, or at least what I think of as a big point. And every now and then, it's the opposite of that, right? It's just kind of a small point, just sort of a little thing to kind of file away in your mind. And this may be a little bit more of an example of that here today. Kind of a small point just to keep in mind, just to remember, because there has been a question out there from some Georgia fans as of late of, you know, this month of June for Georgia, which has been so busy in terms of hosting visitors, yet it hasn't yet really produced the kind of commits that Georgia fans, I think, maybe thought they might get. Now, they obviously have their eye towards July, and on this show we do as well, when guys like Kojo Antwi, we talk, talked about yesterday, and Branson Robinson, when they'll make their commitment decision. But thus far, you, you, know, you haven't seen Georgia get the kind of commits here this month that maybe some other programs have had. Florida has gotten a lot of commits, for instance. I think they've you know had, what, had three in the last week alone, you know, <laughs> varying degrees of pedigree uh, for those uh, recruits. But nonetheless, you know, they've taken a few commits as of late. Georgia really hasn't quite done as much of that. But here is the like, sort of small point just to sort of file away here for a little bit to be remembered later on. That there is really good work, I believe, going on at Georgia here over the course of this month. And here's the way I'd sort of say it. That here at Dog Nation World Headquarters Studios, every now and then, I'll kind of leave the friendly confines of this building and go off and get some lunch somewhere. And I have to kind of walk through a shopping mall to get there. And there's this thing that I've been noticing as of late. Listen, I'm not making fun of mitigations against the coronavirus, because that's obviously a very important thing to do. Uh, but there are sometimes ways in which some of the stuff sort of feels like it's been taken too far to me. Like, you walk through a shopping mall and you see these stores that are essentially empty, and yet there's a like security guard at the front not letting more people in. It's like two people standing in line. It's not like there's a thousand people trying to rush the door here. This isn't like you know Studio 54 or something like that. It's just an empty store, security guard standing there, only letting like a couple people in line. But there's only like two people in line to go into a store that's essentially empty after that. And at this point in time, you know, given the fact that so many people are vaccinated and everything else, you sort of wonder: is that mitigation effort really all that necessary here now? But but obviously it would seem like there's almost sort of a byproduct of all of this, that when it's a business or something like that, it's kind of nice to look busy, right? It's kind of nice to think that you might have a line of people waiting to get into your store that just kind of looks good for your store. The same thing's true for a restaurant as well, right? It's like if you go to a restaurant and, you know, some, a lot of folks are traveling, you know, this time of year and they're, you know, at places they're not quite familiar. And if you want to give a restaurant a try, if you drive to that restaurant, you show up. And if the parking lot looks empty, I don't care what the, you know, the, whatever website you go to for for reviews the ultimate review the thing that may matter more than anything else is if you don't see anybody there you start to wonder wait is this really a restaurant i want to eat at if nobody else is eating here either and plus you know just on the mo the most basic level there's also this thing of we kind of understand this on our own jobs that you know some days are busier than others but it's always kind of nice to be seen looking busy it's always kind of nice to look like you've got a lot going on there is some value in looking busy and i think with georgia and its recruiting efforts right now here in the month of June, you see a lot of this playing out. That the kind of busy vibe that George is giving off this month, 
I think will pay dividends and, and, and really pay off very well in the months to come, no matter how many of the guys that have kind of been kind of cycling in over the course of the last few days, no matter how many of those guys end up choosing Georgia, the fact that so many big names are kind of popping in, having those photos being shared while they're at Georgia, it just kind of creates the sort of busy, exclusive club vibe that you want to create around Georgia football. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Let me show you Kristen Miller here, a big-time defensive line prospect, Cedar Grove High School, one of the top programs in the Atlanta area. He shows off pictures on social media of a recent visit there to Georgia. Now, first of all, let me say this, that if you're watching a video and if you're a podcast only, I apologize. This kind of background with sort of like the red hue is something that Georgia and a lot of these other schools have done for a while. But this new like laser effect, that that is a fantastic looking image uh, there for those photos. Very creative there for Georgia. Really good looking picture uh, for Kristen Miller. Good job by Georgia kind of getting that done. But this is an example of a guy who was, you know, taking a visit Ohio State as of late. Uh, You know, Miller's been linked to a lot of schools. You sort of, you know, left to wonder where Georgia fits in on all of this. Can I tell you with certainty where Kristen Miller is going to go to school, uh, where he's going to sign as a part of the class of 2022? I honestly cannot. I, I, I don't really know that. But but it's a good thing that he's at Georgia. It's a good thing that he's sharing off those, you know, sharing on social media those photos of him being at UGA. It just kind of adds to the to the you know the growing branding you know, image that Georgia's trying to project to the rest of the country. There, I think it's a really nice thing to see. To say nothing of the fact that as Jeff Sintel has recently written there at DogNation.com, one of Miller's high school teammates, uh, Carlton Madden Jr., has also recently earned a uh, offer from Georgia. Cedar Grove, as I said before, has really been kind of a hotbed of talent now for a for a number of years that it's just kind of nice to be seen sort of connected to programs like that another example is, is luther burden who many of you know is a five-star wide receiver and a commit to oklahoma oklahoma does really well when these when, when it comes to these elite high-level wide receivers but burden has recently showed off some photos of him being at uga my understanding is it's a multi-day visit for a burden there to the dogs i have absolutely no idea how real anything like that might be that's not really a name we've spoken about very much in terms of being connected to UJ and all of this but it's never a bad thing to have a five-star wide receiver on your campus once again it kind of creates that vibe you're looking to create the line outside the store looking to get in the crowded parking lot and a restaurant of folks who have kind of validated the value of that spot you know guys like Luther Burton showing off a bunch of photos being at Georgia that just kind of makes Georgia look like the place to be, whether Luther Burden ends up going to UGA or not. There's also a story up at dognation.com right now of Arch Manning. Manning, another one of those sort of like huge big name guys, certainly from a last name standpoint, as big as it can possibly get. Obviously, the son of Cooper Manning and the nephew of Peyton and Eli, grandson of of uh, 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 Archie Manning. That You've got Arch Manning now uh, taking a visit there to Georgia. Certainly, it's way too early to know i guess where manning is leaning all the way around but you know you wouldn't necessarily think that george is necessarily the favorite for arch manning but once again it just sort of looks good to have him on campus so the bottom line of all this is this is a small thing not a big point but it's a point worth remembering that as georgia hosts the biggest of the big names class of 2022 class of 2023 i think it only further cements the idea that georgia just kind of looks like sort of the hip place to be, the place that the biggest names want to be. And some of these guys are obviously going to, you know, Burden may stick with his Oklahoma commitment and whoever else may you know, end up, you know, gravitating towards somewhere else by the time the signing uh, day comes and goes. But for now, the activity that George is involved with, the big name recruits that Georgia brings in for these unofficial and in some case official visits, it just gives off the right vibe for the program. And that vibe, I believe, before it's all said and done, has a chance to really pay off for UGA's recruiting efforts. By the way, we'll have Jeff Sintel on the show tomorrow. We'll talk to him more about that. It's Dog Nation Daily for today, though. The daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Meriwether and Tharp. And great to have you with us no matter how you get to us today. Live on video, 10 a.m. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, from the radio. Uh, looking forward to being with our friends in Athens Sports Radio 960. The Ref here very, very soon. And, of course, podcast-wise, the Apple Player, the Google Player, WorldFamousDogNation.com. Bunch of ways for you to get involved with the program. We just really appreciate you doing all of that. And a big thanks to our friends at Meriwether and Tharp for making it all possible. You know, they are your source for Georgia divorce. You can find them online, the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. When I say your source for Georgia divorce, you'd be fair to ask what that really means. You know, you know, what is that all about? To me, it simply comes down to this. 
It's about understanding all the intricacies of the uh, divorce law procedure. Because let's face it, there are you know, all kinds of facets to that. There's a lot to know, a lot to understand. Meriwether and Tharp sort of gets all of it. And they want to put that to work for you. That means that if you find yourself in a situation where divorce is the next step, obviously you want to take that step as well as you possibly can. You want to set yourself up now for the next season of your life to be as enjoyable as possible. So when it comes to all the things that can be impacted by divorce, finances, and relationship with children, and everything like that, Meriwether and Tharp understands all that. They're going to feel what you feel with you, and they're going to work alongside you to put it all back together and make it be the way that it's supposed to be. So please find them online. Take the step of having that initial consultation and then put them to work for you. They'll be tireless worker for you. They'll fight for you when need be. They'll advise you when, you, when, when that's what's needed. They'll just do whatever it takes to get it done for you. It's the AtlantaDivorceTeam.com. That's the website. That'll get you in touch with Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia Divorce. All right, coming up in a couple of minutes' time, We'll talk to our buddy Terrence Edwards, the great former Georgia wide receiver. A lot to speak to Terrence about today when it comes to the wide receiver situation. Before that, they want to go around the doghouse. And there is obviously a big level of anticipation for Georgia and Clemson, the season opener for week one. We get all of that. We've talked about a lot of that. And the one thing that we saw on the show, I think it was last week while I was on vacation, was there's also kind of an interesting scenario at play for Georgia where it is possible. It's not inconceivable that Georgia could beat Clemson week one. Clemson runs the table after that, wins the ACC, and then Georgia might be in a position where they have to beat Clemson again in the college football playoff because I don't think the committee would shy away from a rematch if these two teams played a very good game in week one, bookending the end of the season with another matchup between the two teams would probably make some sense. I also talked about how Georgia might could be in a position where they also have to beat Alabama twice uh, this year as well. It's just kind of a unique scheduling scenario facing Georgia when it comes to when it comes to all of that but to put that aside here for a moment the 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 difference between Georgia and Clemson I believe is actually fairly stark based on what happens after this game takes place week one and a guy that kind of brought this to mind for me was a guy named Brad Crawford from 24 7 sports who recently writing about uh, Clemson calling it really one of the most manageable schedules in the country for the upcoming season obviously after you get past the Georgia game uh, in week one, where Clemson right now is about a three, three and a half point favorite, depending on which sports book you're looking at. Uh, this is what Brad Crawford writes from 24 7 Sports. I want to read this just briefly. He says, Go ahead and grab the Sharpie and Mark Dabo Swinney's team back in the college football playoff. With all 11 starters back defensively and a rising sophomore quarterback, uh, offensive coordinator Tony Elliott and the rest of this staff feels confident in the Tigers won't suffer any drop off thanks to a schedule free of landmines. Clemson's toughest game comes in the opener versus Georgia, a preseason top 10 opponent most likely, but even with a loss there, the Tigers will still be favored by double digits in just about every game prior to the ACC championship appearance. And then he goes on to say they may be even favored as much as 20 points in, in most of those games there as well. And look, we've said before on this show that obviously Georgia, in comparison to what they may be forced to face in some years, actually has a fairly manageable schedule as well. But it is nowhere near as manageable as what Clemson describes there. It's just not. And you think about going on the road to Auburn, there's actually kind of a wide range of opinions about how much of a favorite Georgia is against Auburn. They are a fairly significant favorite on the road, but we're talking like the single digit variety here. It's the kind of game under the right circumstances Georgia could lose. The same thing about the Georgia Florida game there as well. We've seen Georgia kind of favored in that sort of seven, eight point range against Florida right now, but that's not really a, uh, that's not an unlosable game. Do you say it's a double negative? That's not an unlosable losable game you know there for UGA there's at least a little bit of danger connected to that that's the kind of thing that Clemson doesn't really have you know at its at its disposal that's not the kind of thing that Clemson can say most of the games they'll play after that against teams like UConn and then uh, uh South Carolina Boston you know, you know teams like that that's just the kind of thing that uh that, that Clemson's going to find a whole lot more manageable than what Georgia has so what does that mean what do you do with all of this well the, the one thing that we have kind of said here is is that I think the overall understanding of the Georgia Clemson game is probably a little bit different than some people assume. It has been sort of suggested that, well, this game's a great matchup between two teams that could win the national championship, but ultimately the stakes for the game might not exactly be all that high. And I've told you over and over again, I just don't quite believe that's true. Because if you're a Clemson team and you lose this game to Georgia week one, knowing that you're favored to win all the rest of your games, 
and you know clearly have a path back to the ACC championship, it may seem like, as the writer from 24-7 Sports said, you can you know write this in with a Sharpie that Clemson's back in the college football playoff. Maybe so, but you better hope there's no debate to be had anywhere else. You better hope that there isn't a Pac-12 team this year between, like, say, Oregon or some people who, who kind of believe in USC. You better hope a team like that doesn't truly emerge as a side-by-side comparison because all of a sudden you don't have much of, you don't have much in the way of a data point to argue for you. Clemson's had a fairly easy run in the playoff the last few years in terms of getting there because uh, you know kind of an undefeated mark or an ACC championship was enough to hold up in a comparison against anybody else because the Pac-12 for the most part wasn't producing a playoff caliber team. If you're Clemson, you lose to Georgia Week One, you better hope that remains true. To say nothing of the you know the potential rise of a Big 12 team like an Oklahoma or I guess if you want to take Iowa State seriously or something like that. I think the flip side is also potentially true a little bit on the Georgia side on this, too, because as we've said before, Georgia could lose to Clemson, still win the SEC and make the college football playoff. We've never seen the SEC champion excluded from the college football playoff since the entity has been in existence going back to 2014. But once again, you better be really, really careful here. I mean, there is something to be said for tossing out all of your margin for error in week one. That's the kind of thing that will make the collar a little tighter as you go on to play the uh, rest of the 2021 season. So sort of worth keeping in mind. Yes, as the writer from 24-7 Sports suggests, the path for Clemson after that week one game is as easy as anybody in the country. Certainly a little easier than what Georgia faces. But the stakes for the Georgia-Clemson game, I think, remain really high. It's obviously much easier for the winner to make the college football playoff. The loser can still make it. But boy, the margin for error really given away there at the very beginning of the season, at least worth paying a little bit of attention to. That is Around the Doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. Before we're done, speaking of playoff and playoff expansion, there's an update to give you on that. There's a big name from the 2023 class that's mentioned Georgia now as one of his finalists. We will cover all of that before we're done. But as you've come to expect here on Thursdays, and always a ton of fun to be able to do. Let's talk to our buddy Terrence Edwards here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Mary Weathern Tharp. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Well, still Terrence Edwards here. Always great to have him on the program. His insight always incredibly valuable to us here. And Terrence, I want to start with this for a moment. You know, yesterday we talked on the show about Kojo Antwi, terrific wide receiver for the class of 2022. And Kojo told Jeff, I thought something that was really interesting, that when he, you know, recently took a visit to Georgia and, you know, he enjoyed his time there and obviously had a great time with all of that. But he also said that he came away, and I'm trying to use the exact words that he used, that Georgia made it clear that they were going to throw the ball more this year. And what I've said before is when recruits are saying that, I really kind of perk up and listen to that because they get a chance to see more of the program than I'm ever going to get a chance to see as a media person or a fan would be able to see, that apparently Kojo Antwi really believes there is truly kind of an offensive evolution taking place at UGA I mean how much do you buy into that as well Terrence that what Kojo says that he's been told by Georgia coaches and what obviously fans hope is true really is the case and then this offense in 2021 will be different than maybe it's been the last couple of years for the dogs um you know you you always could go by what people say you can only take people at their word but I like action if you just think about the four games that JT Daniels started last year he they, we threw for 400 yards. So that's the proof to me that they're going to try to open it up more. I think they believe in JT and put the ball in his hands. And, you know, the one game that we, we did rush for like 300 yards, I, you know, as a receiver, you got to continue to run the ball when you rush for 300 yards. You shouldn't throw it. So uh, the evidence is there that the four games that he started, he threw for 400 yards. So that leads me to believe that they're going to throw the ball more. Yeah, I think that you're bringing up a lot of good points, and I agree with your point about the South Carolina game because of the games that Daniel started a year ago, that was the one game they really didn't throw it. But as you said, if you go back and look at the numbers, Georgia ran the ball that day for nearly 10 yards a clip. There aren't very many teams in the country that throw the ball for 10 yards per you know play, uh, but that's what Georgia was rushing the ball for. So pretty clearly, Georgia saw something on film from a pretty depleted South Carolina team. If memory serves, you had guys like, I think Kingsley Ngabari was out that. You, you had some defensive linemen who were kind of out for, for South Carolina that may have contributed to that. Georgia just saw the chance to get an easy win, and you don't turn down an easy win on the road in SEC play. So maybe in terms of your evaluation of JT Daniels, you throw that South Carolina game sort of out and look at the other games there. And as you said, 
and we've said this in the show before, that to me, if you want to kind of speak about JT Daniels as kind of a known commodity, the fact that Todd Munkin, having watched him practice, Todd Munkin having been in meeting rooms with JT Daniels and knowing what he was ready to do, the fact that from the word go against Mississippi State and against Missouri and certainly a bowl game against Cincinnati, the fact they were willing to let him throw the ball so much and that to my eyes, and I'm thinking to yours as well, the Georgia offense just looked so much different than it looked uh, you know, prior and previous to that. To me, that's what you need to know right there is that the Georgia coaches seem to know what they have and Daniels does give them a chance to to – to be different here this year and, and be a little bit more of a prolific passing team they've maybe been in the past? Oh, I think so. I think so. I, I don't think you could go into a game uh, really one-dimensional. I still think you got to be able to run the ball with those horses that we have in the backfield, but you also got to be explosive in the passing game. You just look at the the, the teams that have won it. Uh, they have been very, very prolific in the passing game, and that scares people, being able to – Throw the ball up and down the field scares people more than being able to run the ball up and down the field. And when you're able to do both, uh, that just brings a different dimension to an offense. Just look at LSU, look at Alabama, I mean, look at Clemson. Those teams have been able to do both very well. And now as a defensive coach, you have to try to take one away, and that scares defensive coaches more than anything. Do you think – and this is not always a pleasant topic for fans to consider, but I think it's probably worth mentioning here. Do you think in the past, in recent years, there were some receiver recruiting targets for UGA who just didn't believe that was on the horizon, that that maybe if a guy like Antwi sees more of an opportunity in the Georgia offense now, that that's actually a little bit of a change from where things have been, even as recently as the last couple of recruiting cycles where maybe some receivers just had their doubts about how they'd be used at a place like UGA? Because, I mean, let's, let, let's be honest, Georgia was effective running the football. They did have the big offensive lineman. That's been a recipe that's that's worked to the tune of a, of a good bit of success. The passing game has probably lagged a little bit in, in light of all of that. I mean, do you think that has hurt Georgia with some receivers in the uh, recent past? I, I would just take it to Alabama. Alabama has been known for, just like Georgia, having a big offensive line, but kind of three yards in a cloud of dust. And Nick Saban kind of turned that offense over to, I think, probably Lane Kiffin first and yeah. so on and so on. And look at the receivers that they've gotten because of the productivity of that passing game. So they weren't getting these type of receivers before. Yes, the Julio Jones has come through, but to have five first round picks in the, in the, in one room at the receiving position because they saw the opportunity that they knew they was going to get the ball downfield in a way they was going to be used. And I think now, uh, that Georgia is trending in that same direction. Now you just got to go and prove it on the field. Let me squeeze in one more on this topic really quick here for a moment. So if this Georgia offensive evolution is truly occurring, which of the Georgia receivers, and obviously you know a lot of these guys really well, but which of the Georgia receivers do you think stand to kind of benefit from that most? Because if JT Daniels, and we've said this on the show, if, if JT Daniels kind of has the, the year that the most favorable projections would suggest for him, that's obviously going to be good for a lot of these Georgia pass catchers there as well. Terrence, who do you think is set up most to maybe benefit from that right now? Uh, Jermaine Burton. I think he's the you know the most explosive uh, receiver that we have downfield threat outside of Arian Smith. But I just think Jermaine is a little bit more complete of a receiver than Arian. Uh, but I think Jermaine Burton, uh, and he's comparable to me, uh, to Jamar Chase. He's very mm -hmm. similar to Jamar Chase. Uh, so I think he can have, not saying he's going to be Jamar Chase, but their their skill set is very similar. Um, so I think he could be the guy, especially with George Pickett's been out now, to be the guy that benefits the most. And I think uh, Eric is going to have an opportunity to uh, use his talent. I just think that the receiving core as a whole is going to benefit from them throwing the ball more downfield. And that is going to allow the running game to open up as well. I mean, you just think about Najee Harris. Uh, his his season is – people don't even talk about his season because of what Devontae Smith did. And he had 25 touchdowns, I think, with 1,500 yards rushing. Uh, so the passing game will open up a lot of the other for their talent as well and the running game as well. 
So I want to talk to you more about a big change that seems like it's on the rise in here for college football. We'll do that with Terrence Edwards coming in. But a moment before that, though, let me briefly mention this. You know, so many of you have reached out to me to say, B.A., boy, I really am enjoying something that you've been telling us about now for a while. I'm talking about the Finnish Long Drink, a great ready-to-drink beverage. It comes in a can, but it's not a beer. It's a it's like a ready-to-drink mixed drink cocktail. It's amazing. You've got uh, multiple choices here. You can get the Long Drink Cranberry, which so many of the folks in Athens seem to be enjoying, or the Long Drink Strong. There's a Long Drink zero there's the original which i really kind of enjoyed which comes in the blue can it's got that gin kick to it but it's also got the sort of citrus flavor kind of a grapefruit type taste this is the kind of thing that's been popular in finland going back to like the 1950s a part of the summer games there in helsinki then but it's been in america for now for a couple of years and it's in georgia now in fact if you'll check out this website thelongdrink.com you can find out where it is close to you whichever beverage store you go to or in some cases bars or whatever what whatever you can kind of find where it is close to you ready to drink right out of the can a great partner for you wherever you're going this spring and summer check them out uh the long and you can find out a lot more about what a lot of our audience is really falling in love with the finished long drink great great drink a lot of fun here uh this summer make sure you check that out here today terrence something else that seems to be a lot of fun for a lot of college football players is the burgeoning name image likeness conversation and this doesn't really impact georgia as much because the state of georgia has already kind of passed its own nil law but now there's i guess recommendations coming down in the ncaa that would also give the states that haven't quite yet passed their own their own nil law to also allow their players to benefit from that by the schools themselves kind of making their own rules here the ncaa basically giving them the freedom to do that or at least suggesting that as a possibility here right now you're a former player had this been in place when you were playing at georgia you clearly would have had the opportunity to cash in on some of this kind of stuff you talked a lot of future players and current players right now what is the mood right now around the the growth of name image likeness but also i guess kind of simultaneous to that the feeling that maybe some of the movement of you know congress supreme court things like that could even open the door for more compensation for players in the future what are players saying about that right now man it, it is starting not just with the players with the parents and in youth football they are starting to get brands and starting to get uh, logos for these kids as early as youth football. That, And it's just going to follow, follow them throughout their youth, middle school, high school, then college career. So it, it is a trickle-down effect, um, not just high school. It, it's trickle-down to the middle school and the youth football league. Um, and I think I, I need to go back and get a little a reimbursement for my time of not being able to cash in on all the autographs that I was able to sign for free so now. <laughs> but it, it, it is a uh, it is something I think is big for the student athlete. Um, when I signed my letter of intent, I basically gave the university a permission and owned my likeness for four years uh, while I was there. And I think it's a good thing that now these athletes will be able to um, have opportunity to sign their name that, they, that their parents gave them and not being able to have the NCAA or the university cash in on their likeness, not the athletes to cash in on their own likeness. So, Terrence, one of the things I think is really valuable is I like to bring on voices on the show that are different from me because – I don't want this show to be just an echo chamber for my own opinion. And Terrence, like one of the things I have said here is, is that I'm a little skeptical of some of these changes. You know, I think that the radical way in which college football is evolving evolves at such a speed that I think it threatens the health of college football. And I'm trying to make my point, uh, you know, pretty clear on that. You know, I, I'm I'm curious to hear from you about this though. That when you bring in like more opportunities for name, image, likeness, you mentioned autograph signings, and you know you may talk about some endorsements, things like that, or maybe just one day, just you know, you know, flat out, you know, cash payments. I, I guess one of the things that concerns me a little bit is that the role of the coach would be lessened to, to, to a degree, and all of a sudden, you know, more voices are creeping in, and you know. The SEC made a statement the other day where they talked about the role that advisors were going to play in all of this. And I do think the kind of advice you get as a player matters, and you got to be careful who you take that advice from. And I think that we vetted coaches for the most part, and we, you know, we certainly know that they have, you know, a lot of vested interest in making sure they're, you know, doing right by the players. But some of the advisors that may crop up in kind of a name, image, likeness world are, are, are people that we don't quite have as much public vetting for. 
Is there any part of you as kind of a former player or a guy that still has strong relationship with the current players, is there any part of you that's concerned about what I just described there? Uh, I'd say a small portion I am. Um, The biggest thing that I'm concerned about is when you refer to, you know, the coaches having uh, the authority over the players. And I, I always refer back to the professional ranks is, these guys are making a lot of money, and when they're fined fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, that doesn't bother them. But right. when you start playing with their playing time, that bothers a player more than you taking money away from, them, especially in the professional rank. So even if Terrence Edwards was there and, and making however much money on his personal likeness, if I'm not playing on Saturday because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm not disrespecting the coach, or I think I'm better than what I am, don't play him on Saturday and. That goes to now he can go to the transfer portal. Now you will have a lot. So it is a it is a slippery slope uh, to say, but I think we all would adapt. And at times, I to to me the transfer portal is a bigger issue than everything that you just said. I, yeah. I don't I don't per, I don't per se like the tra- transfer portal. Um, I don't like the kids being able to just change schools without some type of. Uh, repercussion sent out, maybe not sent out 50% of the season, maybe, but I just don't like the port of kids transferring. And if you get on a kid or coach a kid hard, he just jump in the portal and go to another team. That's the part I don't like, but the name likeness, I earned that. I earned that by my play, by what I did. So I should be able to benefit off my own given name by my parents. No, I think that's a really strong argument, Terrence. I'm glad that you uh, made that. Let me squeeze this in really quick before we let you go. I, I talked earlier this week about the story of Jordan Davis, and to me this coincides with UGA recruiting a little bit because right now, Terrence, as you know, there's all this question about, hey, who are the elite defensive linemen that Georgia's going to get a chance to sign for the class of 2022? And at one point in time it seems like it was Bear Alexander. Now Alexander would seem to be you know, more likely to go to a place like Texas A&M. All of a sudden folks are talking about Walter Nolan or Travis Shaw or you know, whichever of those names you kind of want to mention. In, in, in light of all of this, and there are some big names that Georgia is in the mix for. And, and what I've said on the show is, Terrence, is that when you look at a guy like Jordan Davis, who's a former three-star, who shows up on preseason All-American lists, first-team All-SEC lists, you know, potential first-round pick for the uh, 2022 NFL draft, that when you look at a potential success story like that of a guy who not everyone was even sure was going to be a defensive lineman at the SEC level, who all of a sudden now has a chance to be among the very best defensive tackles in the entire country, if Davis goes out and plays the way this year that certainly seems to be possible for him, doesn't that take care of every unanswered question you have in recruiting after that? Because clearly the next generation of defensive linemen has got to be watching that pretty closely, right? No, definitely. I mean, you just think about the two D tackles that we have on the team right now with Devontae White and Jordan Davis. Both of those guys was not highly recruited, but it's going to be probably the two best that we have had in a long time. Man, we got to give Trey Scott his, his kudos. He, he is a developer. He's a coach. Uh, yes, I think he's recruited well. I don't, some people just go off the recruiting services, and we're not getting the five-star, the four-star. Four but when you can develop a kid to play – as a five-star and a four-star in college, not off of high school, but in college. Those are the guys that I want on my team, man. I will, and I love, and Trey Scott is one of the best defensive line coaches in America because he developed the guys that want to be Georgia Bulldogs. Terrence, uh, always strong stuff. I just really appreciate your perspective on UGA football, and I really appreciate the work. I talked before about the role that coaches play. You know, that's not just for the guys who are you know coaching on the sidelines on Saturdays. That's for the guys who are working with these players throughout the course of their development, and that's something, certainly something that you're doing in a very big way. That matters to me. I'm glad we have good men working on the next generation of uh, good men as well, and you're doing that with your personal wide receiver tutoring, your wide receiver academy. Tell folks how they can be a part of that if they've got a son who wants to catch footballs at a high level, how can they get some of the training that you're providing? Uh, you can find me on all social media at Terrence Elwood's Wide Receiver Academy on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Terrence, great stuff. Thanks for being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Thart. We'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. So I'm glad we have a chance to hear from other perspectives. And I've obviously, you know, as I said before, expressed some skepticism about some of these changes that are coming to college football. But when you listen to Terrence make an argument there, he makes a pretty strong one. He says, listen, 
my name, image, and likeness is something I've earned. Like whatever value my name has, that belongs to me. That shouldn't belong to somebody else. And frankly, I'm going to tell you right now, that's a very difficult thing to argue against. And when I look at some of the name, image, likeness stuff that's out there around college football, just inside the fishbowl of just that issue, I do sort of find it hard to be against, especially when you listen to the way it was described by Terrence Edwards there. But here's where like my skepticism kind of creeps in. You know, think about a guy like Jay Billis. Many of you know Jay, the ESPN college basketball analyst, the guy who, you know, sort of sits there in a pretty big chair in terms of calling these college basketball games and also a very outspoken critic of the NCAA. You know, the other day he had a tweet that said something to the effect of, when it comes to stuff like this, it's just commerce. It shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be complicated. And once again, at face value, a statement like that feels like it's very difficult to argue against. But when you start looking more deeply at all of this, it feels like what a guy like Billis is saying is actually an oversimplification of the situation. That who could be against commerce? Who could be against free market? Who could be against all that kind of stuff? And yet you're sort of left to wonder, wait, is that really what's going on here? Because concurrent to a guy like Jay Billis saying that, there's also the Knight Commission, one of these sort of fancy pants, think tank type, uh, you know, group of people, very you know, you know, well connected, well known, uh, well credentialed people, you know, kind of from the NCAA talking about how they'd like to see changes occur in college sports this same week. Associated Press does a story on this. They're talking about using all this as a way of kind of putting a cap on the compensation that coaches are earning right now. That that all of a sudden, hey, this is just commerce. This is just free market. Boy, sometimes when it, when you see the way in which you know some of the the most well connected people to college athletics are viewing the role of coaches in all of this, I think you're left to wonder. This actually sort of feels like the opposite of commerce. This sort of actually feels like the opposite of free market. It feels like we're not only trying to put a cap on the 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 compensation for coaches. But we're trying to reduce the role that coaches play in our society. Because, listen, there is something to be said for the strong authority figure who asserts that authority based on his expertise to make young people better. And in some respects, that sort of feels like it's sort of an out of style uh, idea in our in our current society. Uh, but I think the role of coaches at the college level, at the high school level, at the youth sports level, I think is still a incredibly, incredibly valuable thing. And the more we kind of allow, and Terrence said this really well, he says, I'm not that scared of name and image and likeness, but I don't like the transfer port. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing to hear Terrence say. Like the more we allow these sort of outside forces to kind of creep in, and as Terrence said with his own words a moment ago, all of a sudden, if, I, if I'm going to coach a guy hard, if I'm going to have a high standard for accountability in this program, that player wants to then sort of dart away from my program and kind of jet into the transfer portal, I tell you, that doesn't feel like a that, that does not feel like a good step in the right direction for this sport. If we're reducing the the ability that coaches have to influence players, because there is no more tried and true mechanism for self improvement for young people than to listen to a coach, do what he says, become a better man because of it. That's the thing that works, decade after decade. Now going on more than a century, that's the thing that works. And the more we kind of reduce the possibility that can happen for the next generation i think we're causing a problem and i think that's worth keeping in mind when it comes to all of that we'll have more sec through stuff here coming up in just a moment let me also kind of say this there a little bit as well um actually let me just move on here do the rest of the sec through here uh just for a moment so uh uh i, I kind of talked about uh, some of the the uh, the other stuff there with the name image likeness. Let, let me move on and say this. I saw where Scott Strickland had a very interesting idea that he kind of put forth about how scheduling may change. Okay, I'm sort of off my show sheet. Let me let me st- let me start all over on all this again. So uh, there was a very another very interesting uh, kind of change that has been been kicked around with college football involving the 12 team playoff. And let me give you an update on all this. Uh, here just for a moment. So the College Football Playoff Board of Managers on Tuesday, it's going back a couple of days, approved a feasibility study of moving the College Football Playoff to 12 teams. Uh, so it looks like we're kind of moving forward here a little bit. Eventually, not it's not done deal yet. It's not kind of in the, uh, in the books yet. But it looks like we could be heading towards a direction of a 12-team playoff coming sooner now rather than later for college football. You know, this is one of those things that – you sort of get the impression that it is indeed about to happen. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have so many specific details about exactly what the format's going to be. So there were more meetings about this this week. There were more 
Um, there were there were there were more discussions about that this week, and we're kind of heading in that direction. It's not official. It's not done. But you certainly don't get any kind of impression that, that that's not going to be uh, the way that uh, college football is going on all of that. As far as the rest of our SEC through goes there uh, for a moment, I talked about some of the name, image, lightness stuff there uh, on the heels of the Terrence Edwards uh, interview. So let me kind of move on to something else. I saw our Florida Athletic Director Scott, Scott Strickland has a very interesting schedule proposal on the table here where he'd like to see college football move in the direction of basically playing 11 Power 5 games each and every year. And I think this is kind of an interesting thing because Florida is one of those programs over the years that has probably had less of this than most teams do. Florida plays Florida State every single year. That is a state law mandated thing in the state of Florida. And because of that, for a long time, Florida has been one of these programs that has just been a little bit more resistant to some of the more high profile non-conference series. They did play Michigan a couple of years ago. But that's not the kind of thing that they have done with regularity. But now you even have a, uh, an athletic director like Scott Strickland talking about what he wants to see the scheduling model be moving forward, which I think speaks to something that Kirby Smart said now going on a couple of years ago that it's turned out to be true. And this is not just, you know, Georgia's show bragging about Georgia. I just think it's objectively correct and true that Kirby Smart's idea about the what he viewed at the time as the likelihood of playoff expansion – being a motivating force to now play tougher schedules each and every year. And Georgia goes out and starts scheduling the high profile, the Texases and all the big names. Oklahoma became eventually a part of that. Uh, more games against Clemson. you got Florida State coming up. You've got all these high profile series. Eventually, it was even programs like Ohio State that Georgia's added. That all of that theory that Smart seemed to notice, identify, talked about very openly back during 2019, all of a sudden has now become essentially the the – you know that, that there's a carbon copy of that that exists at almost every other you know level now of college football where it, it certainly seems like that one of the latent benefits to playoff expansion may be tougher schedules, better schedules, more challenging schedules for all teams around college football. That's probably a pretty interesting thing to be able to see. One of the things we talked about on SEC Country Live yesterday, uh, maybe a little bit more trouble for Caden Salter here, the recent Tennessee quarterback signing, a guy that was suspended from the Vols program for a while because of an altercation uh, that took place on campus a few months ago, eventually reinstated, has now, I guess, allegedly been arrested again. Let me show you this from uh, one of the Knoxville news sources there, TV reporter uh, going on Twitter to say that two Vols football players face, this is uh, Cole Sullivan's his name, he uh, reports on Twitter that two Vols football players face misdemeanor charges for uh, including drug possession after a traffic stop early Saturday morning near campus. He says one of those players was uh, freshman quarterback Caden Salter, who, as I said before, was just reinstated to the team three weeks ago. As I said on SEC Country Live yesterday, you know, we're kind of in a day and age now where a kind of a minor drug possession is not necessarily as big of a deal as it maybe at one time uh, was, whether it should be or shouldn't is a different discussion. It's just kind of not. However, in the case of Salter, knowing this comes shortly after a previous issue, it kind of kept him away from the Tennessee program. Program. If you're Salter and you want to have a you want to have a career there in Knoxville, this is probably the kind of thing you have to be a little bit careful about because there are like a half dozen quarterbacks on the Tennessee roster between two transfers, holdovers from the uh, Jeremy Pruitt era. Uh, Salter not doing very much to ingratiate himself to new coach Josh Heupel. You almost have to kind of assume on that. Also, one of the things we meant to mention on yesterday's show and just kind of as it sometimes does slip through the cracks, Trayon Webb, former UGA commit. 2023 five-star athlete has now pared down his group of finalists here and he says i'm going to be committing to one of these schools in august on cbs sports and you see georgia there you see oklahoma there you see ohio state so webb a former uga commit uh now back on the open market for the class of 2023 and it's now kind of whittled it down to ohio state oklahoma and georgia so georgia kind of involved in a uh, big name here for that class of 2023 and as we, we kind of started the show by saying this, there is a lot of uh, activity right now around Georgia. Class of 2022, class of 2023, big time visitors, a lot of guys naming finalists. And it's nice to see Georgia kind of in the mix for all of this, especially on the heels of a couple of high profile decommitments. Certainly that has not slowed down Georgia's recruiting efforts uh, whatsoever. I want to show you this quick video for those of you who are watching online. If you're listening to uh, podcasts, I'll describe it to you. So the other day, uh, Mississippi State had a thrilling victory against Virginia in the College World Series. And it's actually been kind of a, you know, a wild time for these SEC teams in the College World Series. You had 
what I, I guess Tennessee's now been eliminated, but you had you know a kind of a weird victory for Vanderbilt where they kind of won on a wild pitch, and the other night the uh, thrilling victory for Mississippi State there against Virginia, and you see the way that uh, uh, Mississippi State was greeted by Bulldogs fans. Our buddy Tom Hart, the SEC Network broadcaster, catched caught this on video and shared it there online. And you just see the the mood that exists in this hotel lobby. First of all, it's kind of nice to have the College World Series back after not having that a year ago. There are a couple of sporting events like this where uh, I think the appetite for them is going to be really great. The British Open and golf is a little bit like this. We didn't have a British Open last year. So with that coming up in a couple of weeks, there's a huge I think, appetite for that. There's no College World Series a year ago, so a big appetite for that. But the other thing you see is it's just the way these SEC teams that are lucky enough to be in Omaha right now are having such a good time. And I don't know if you're noticing this the way that I am, and maybe this is simply because of the fact we didn't have this event a year ago, but it seems like there's a lot of media coverage, a lot of, I guess, sort of evangelizing for college baseball right now in a way that would not have existed maybe a couple of years ago. This kind of seems to be a sport on the rise, and the SEC obviously seems to be in sort of the middle of that, and there's a little bit of FOMO, fear of missing out, that you know, for a Georgia fan who thought his team maybe had a chance to be there a year ago, and obviously the, the the season didn't even take place, you see these SEC teams having fun in Omaha right now. Certainly if you're a Georgia fan, you hope to see the Diamond Dogs in a situation like that here very soon. Of course, the softball team enjoyed Oklahoma City, hoping to see the baseball team get a chance to do that in their version of the sport here very, very soon. We'll make that your SEC through. And here on uh, the program, we like to close out the show each and every day, it's kind of the same way. We'll do a uh, Gator Hater Roll Call where we kind of shout out those who love those lousy, stinking Gators. But sometimes we just like to have a little bit of fun there as well. And this is something I also mentioned yesterday on SEC Country Live. So our, our friends over at uh, CFB Reddit, the uh, Reddit page for college football, had kind of noticed that in the latest edition of Madden, one of the rookie quarterbacks, former Alabama quarterback Mac Jones, that his likeness, we talk about name, image, likeness. I'm not quite so sure that Madden is all that familiar with uh, Mac Jones' name, image, and likeness. If you see this on video, uh, that's not quite what Mac Jones looks like. In fact, let me kind of give you an idea of what Mac Jones does look like side by side with this photo. Like, that does not appear to be the same person. If you're Mac Jones, you're going to be pretty disappointed about that all the way around. Madden can't get your face more correct than that. Nonetheless, that's our golden shoe winner for today. Gatorade, a roll call. How about a hundred and... 28 days from right now, 128 days from right now, Georgia goes back to Jacksonville. We think they get some revenge against the lousy, stinking Gators, and we can't wait to see that happen. It's our Gator Hater Countdown. We'll see you tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And on video, time now for our R.S. Andrews cool down, air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric. You can trust R.S. Andrews to do all that for you. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. Uh, that is something that you can trust R.S. Andrews to do today. Uh, we'll take a few of your comments here, and uh, we'll find out what you're thinking about Georgia football and all the other fun stuff there. Just make sure you check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com. They'll take good care of you. Air conditioning unit, you want to get that thing back to factory fresh specs, they'll certainly give you a chance to do that. And so we appreciate you being with us here. Yes, sir. Some uh, breaking news on a subject you just talked about. Uh, Caden Salter, the Tennessee quarterback, has been dismissed from the program. You hate to see that. And, like, that's one of those things, like, I mean, I honestly do hate to see that because – when you are 50 years old, you will one day look back and say, well, I had a chance to be quarterback at Tennessee, and I kind of, you know, you know, I didn't take care of my business, didn't do what I need to do. And, you know, we, we kind of live in modern times where, like, you know, minor drug possession thing, in some cases that's even been decriminalized in, in a lot of places. But when you have that issue on top of – what had previously happened there, you just sort of hate to see it. And this was a numbers game that was very easy to identify. They've taken two transfer quarterbacks. They have a bunch of holdovers in the Jeremy Pruitt era. They just don't have time to be messing around with somebody who can't stay out of trouble. So in the case of Caden Salter, he's on his way out the door. Uh, Matt Rukavina says, wasn't that Harrison Bailey's job anyway? I would say that if I were – no, I, I'm speaking from a couple of hundred miles away here. So my, you know, certainly opinion on this doesn't matter as much as those who are close to the situation. But if I were Josh Heupel, this to me is a test of leadership for Heupel right away. Because you bring in Hendon Hooker, the former Virginia Tech quarterback. You bring in Joe Milton, the former uh, Michigan quarterback. You have, as you said, you know, guys like Harrison Bailey in the program. To me, you have two choices here. You could choose a, a Milton or a Hooker and maybe be a little bit more respectable on the field this year. Or you could choose a Harrison Bailey, someone who's a kind of homegrown product for your program, somebody that was 
or originally recruited and signed there, although by a previous coaching staff, and you could kind of build something for the future. And if I was a Vols fan, I believe I would want it to be a guy like Bailey who you could build around for the future. And I have no idea how good Harrison Bailey is, if that's really, you know, kind of, uh, you know, really what he's set up to be able to do. But to me, a test of leadership for Josh Heupel would be, are you willing to endure some rough roads now in order to create a better situation for you in the future? And if you are, it's a guy like Harrison Bailey that you turn to there. And if you are just – uh, looking for a guy like a hooker or a guy like a Milton, then essentially you're trying to put a sort of a short-term salve on you know what may be a bigger long-term problem. When they brought in Joe Milton, Milton at one point in time was a very big name. I mean, Milton was thought to be a quarterback who could be something of a savior for Michigan. That obviously didn't work out. Now he's at Tennessee. I said when they brought in Joe Milton that to me it felt like it just sort of felt like the wrong thing to be able to do for a program that has had lots of transfer portal issues, guys exiting the program, you know, bringing a quarterback like this in who's going to make other quarterbacks want to look around to me sort of felt like the wrong kind of trend for Tennessee. But as I said before, I'm sure Vols fans don't really care about my opinion on that. (laughs) Bill Sanders. I can't read that, but that is very funny. Um, Nick Roundtree says it's June 24th, 2021. And uh, Darth Mullen is still the biggest clown in college football. I uh, like that. Uh, Philip Jordan Wells talking about Trey Young. So I'll just say this is a very quick PSA in all of this, that if people who care about Atlanta sports, if you live in Atlanta and you care about Atlanta sports, like if you haven't gotten on the Hawks bandwagon yet, I really think you're missing out on what is really just one of the very fun things that has happened in this town in quite some time. There have not been – a lot of moments like this. I think you could say the Falcons in 2016 were a little bit of a version of that where it was kind of a bad first half that turned into this run and like it was very slowly you know kind of building to the point where like wow, this team has a has a real chance here and then they you know kind of you know go through a nice run in the playoffs and obviously end up you know getting the Super Bowl and it ends up being kind of a disappointing loss there. When you win game 1 on the road of the Eastern Conference Finals you are absolutely a team capable of winning the NBA championship. Now, I'm not saying that's what they're going to do. I'm saying there is no barrier right now that prevents them from being able to do this. This is a team that could possibly win the NBA championship. And that is amazing because a year ago, they weren't even invited to uh, go to the bubble. They didn't even make the bubble a year ago. What is it they call it? The, um, you know how they have the great eight in, uh, the, or the elite eight in college basketball? <laughs> Last year, they were part of the Delete Eight, the eight teams that didn't make the bubble. That's where they were a year ago. That's where they were in, like, February. As recently as February, this was, like, one of the more irrelevant teams in all of the NBA. And then, obviously, Nate McMillan gets hired as interim coach, and the rest is clearly history. This has the feeling of – I'm not going to compare it to the 91 Braves or anything like that because that was a very, very different type of thing, I think, all the way around. But the feeling is not totally dissimilar in terms of – not only are they winning, they're winning with style. Last night's game was incredibly entertaining. Um, you know, I would say that my NBA fandom now is not what it once was. I just don't have as much time to watch these games as I used to. I'm not going to tell you I've been watching a bunch of regular season Hawks all year long because I just I haven't been. But they are can't miss TV for me right now, for sure. Uh, Nick Roundtree talking about Shaq doing the bird call. Yeah, last night. I mean. It was actually kind of funny because eventually Charles Barkley was like, when was the last time that Atlanta was even on TNT? And as I'm sitting there watching this, I was thinking the same thing. Like John Collins gave a great interview. Collins is a very, very likable dude, uh, SEC guy out of Vanderbilt. Uh, you know, Shaq's doing the bird call thing. John Collins kind of joins that with him. He was super thankful to be interviewed by Shaq and, and, and Charles and Kenny. He was obviously thrilled to be on TV, said he'd never been interviewed by the TNT guys there before. So you do see a Hawks team right now that seems to be enjoying their moment because, like I said, if you live in Atlanta or if you just follow the NBA, you know this, that those inside the NBA guys, it's not like they've been sitting around talking a bunch of Hawks basketball, but obviously last night, the only game in town, there's this whole like TNT postgame show devoted to the Hawks. It is a very surreal scene, a very surreal scene, but a very, very good time all the way around. All right, Um, Green Soldier says he's out of surgery and tired of all the losers posting lies on Dog Nation Daily. Uh, Green, I'm glad to hear that you're feeling okay, and sorry sorry that the the haters and the losers are causing you trouble, of which there are many. Um, 
Breda Pest Management. Good to see him as part of the program here today. Stephen Wainwright said, I stopped watching the NBA when Michael Jordan retired. I mean, listen, I watch less NBA than I used to, but this team right now is a lot of fun, man. They are a lot of fun. DMART42 said, John Collins had a real bird call. He said, I don't know what noises Shaq was making. Yeah, that was really pretty funny. Really pretty funny. Scott Harris said, already in the cool down. He says, I missed everything. Well, Scott, I'm glad that you're here right now. Jordan Bowman says South Carolina has a losing record over half the teams in the ACC. So uh, Jordan dunking on his in-state rival, the Gamecocks, there a little bit. See, this is one of those things, Jordan, I'm not quite how sure, sure how old you are, but this is one of those things where, like back in the 80s, which is the era in which I was a child, I was a, I was a child in the 80s, but like a lot of children, I was a huge sports fan. And like the world of college sports was just so different back then, right? Like South Carolina was an independent. And so South Carolina would play – like, Georgia and South Carolina played every year, but not an SEC game. That was an ind- just an independent game. And Gamecocks were playing a bunch of ACC teams back then, obviously Clemson every year, but playing other ACC teams there as well. I don't know if they were ever officially in the ACC or not. Maybe they were at one point in time. I, I don't know that. They were in, like, the Metro Conference for basketball there for a while. Uh, but my memory was, you know, football uh, independent. But they were playing a bunch of ACC teams um, back in that day for sure. Nature Gator still reveling in his team's victory against uh, Georgia this past season, and he deserves to crow about that for a little bit. I mean, it's the job of Georgia to make sure he doesn't get to crow past October 30th. That's just the job there. John Adams says, good to see college baseball being healthy in a big event. Any college sport drawing big crowds, media attention helps football indirectly, uh, which stands on top of all college athletics. It, it does. And look, here's like the one thing that is just kind of true. I would love nothing more than to be able to talk about another sport besides football. Me personally, I'd like to be able to do that. It's sort of like the rock band who would love to play their new music, but people want to hear the greatest hits. You know, there's a little bit of that sometimes in a show like this where like the show would just be interesting if you could talk about baseball, things like that. But that's really not what people want. Um, people genuinely want as much football talk as they can get. And they genuinely, to this point in time, don't quite want that from some of the other sports. And that's not to say that nobody does. I mean, people are individuals, and individuals can be different. But collectively speaking, the audience, the the overwhelming majority of the audience only wants football. So I do get a little bit excited when I see the growth of another sport. And listen, baseball would obviously have a long way to go to ever be anywhere close to on par with what – you know, with what football is, but the sport does seem to be growing because it really is very entertaining. And the more weird stuff Major League Baseball does, like if you're following some of the, you know, the the banned substance stuff with some of the pitchers and the fact they're having to take their clothes off on the field to be checked, like baseball, Major League Baseball has a way of just doing some sort of strange stuff from time to time. Um, and the more that does, the more college baseball, I think, has a chance to kind of benefit from that. Because, like, the one thing college baseball has kind of going for it is the season's not crazy long. It's relatively short. And those weekend series, uh, you know, SEC teams against each other, those games all matter. And, like, the one thing that social media gives us a chance to see, and the SEC network has done a really good job with this, too, the one thing that um, uh, that gives us all a chance to do is, we get to see the scene in these places, like in Oxford, Mississippi at Ole Miss, when they had a home run, everybody throws the beverages up in the air in the outfield. Like, that's a great scene. As much as it pains me to admit, some of the stuff that happened in Knoxville this year uh, was just an incredible scene. The walk-off home run, the NCAA Regional. I'm watching right now the highlights of last night's game. Vanderbilt winning on a walk-off wild pitch against Stanford. Uh, frankly, I don't <laughs> I don't really care for either one of those schools to ball that much. Uh, certainly Vanderbilt baseball is uh, fairly annoying as I'm seeing a shirtless Commodore on the uh, on the TV screen in front of me, but it's great drama. Uh, it's really cool to see the way in which uh, college baseball is kind of growing here. All right. Um, what else? Brady Pass Management says the dreaded D word. I'm not really quite sure which D word that is. Um, Jordan Bowman says Trey Young got mad disrespectful last night. It's great. Players who embrace a villain role are awesome. Yeah, it comes very natural for him. The little shimmy before he shot the three. Like he he's, he's very comfortable doing that. Uh, it's 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 actually pretty amazing to be able to see. 
Dogfan3 says Green Soldier reminds him of Lane Kiffin. <laughs> that's that's funny. That's not a comparison I think I probably would have made, but pretty funny. Foster Moss says it was a great feeling when my alma mater, Georgia Southern, beat uh, Florida in their house. Just like a throwback Thursday moment. Yeah, Foster, that's good stuff. Good stuff for sure. All right, let's see what else. Let me go back over to Facebook here for a moment. A lot of folks kind of checking in here. Travis McCullough says Nate McMillan's an underrated coach, but the Pacers wish they still had him. Yeah, there are a lot of teams that probably wish they still had McMillan. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of contract he demands at the end of the season. And listen, at this point, I might say pay him whatever. It doesn't affect your salary cap or anything like that. Just give him whatever you need to give him. But pretty clearly, this is a guy who kind of bet on himself and would seem to be standing to benefit from that. Randy Hall says, what about the sound effects? Yeah, so Randy, stay on me on that because I think that is coming for sure. Moose Tame says, I like all UGA sports. And a lot of people do, but not everybody does. And it's not to say they dislike them. They, it just doesn't mean very much to them. I've said before, and, and Moose, I'm not sure where you live, but I think the closer you live to Athens, the more likely you are to kind of be a fan of all the other UGA sports and the farther you get away from that. Georgia's a pretty big state. You know, this is a – I think it's the biggest state, geographically speaking, east of the Mississippi River. It's a fairly big state. Georgia fandom also stretches worldwide. I think the farther you get away from Athens, the town, I think the more you're going to find someone who's probably just a Georgia football fan because there are probably a million Georgia football fans. That's a huge fan base. And the fan base of the other sports is just a, a good bit smaller, which is not to say that it's insignificant, doesn't matter, or anything like that. It's just measurably smaller. And so it's actually one of the cool things about being in Athens is that all the other sports are a pretty big deal. I mean, they sell tickets very well for the gymnastics meets. They, you know, this year was different because of the baseball, because of the coronavirus. But, you know, prior to that, they'd had a nice stretch of selling out every game. It's a small stadium, of course, but they sold out every game for quite some time. And, you know, even like, say, men's basketball, which has obviously had its issues, you know, even that, they haven't had too much trouble selling tickets for whatever reason. Um, you know, there there is a pretty good appetite for other UG athletics when you're in the Athens area. Eric Ray says the passion around college baseball is like the World Series every game. It is. I mean, listen, that's the thing we understand about college sports. It's one of the reasons why I fight to defend college sports. That um, that there is kind of a college sports style passion that exists for all the various levels of the sport. And college baseball certainly has its own version of that. There is just something about cheering for college sports that brings out an extra level of passion that does not seem to exist sometimes for those sports at the professional level. Let's see what else. Phil Rogers says, baseball, basketball, football, the big three get good. Uh, in all sports, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's one of the things that Josh Brooks is trying to do is create a, you know, legacy for UG athletics where it does succeed in all sports. Keith Fold says, if I live closer to Athens, I would support all of our sports, and I think that's probably true, Keith. That, you know, basketball plays like a game on, like you know, pretty commonly plays games on Wednesday night. If you live in the Atlanta area, that can be kind of a hard, hard deal, right? You know, it's hour 45 minutes to get to Athens, hour 45 minutes back when the game is done, bleary-eyed on Thursday, that can be a little bit tough. You know, it's one of the things that, you know, it used to be that Georgia would have a hard time selling tickets on a Wednesday night, but always kind of sold out on a Saturday. That's a lot easier to make that trek over to Athens on a Saturday when there's, you know, no traffic on 316, there's you know, there's no work the next day, and it was just a lot easier to convince people to come to a game on a Saturday than it was on a Wednesday. Now it seems like there's enough local interest to get those games also sold out on Wednesdays. But a lot of the people, if you go like, if Georgia's playing like, you know, Tennessee on a Wednesday night in Stegman Coliseum and you go walk up the aisles and ask folks where they live, I'm guessing a lot of those folks live in Athens, Watkinsville, Monroe, somewhere like that. Um... Randy Hall says, disappointing about bowling, not qualifying for the Olympics. See, I saw that. I have to admit, I'm not a very big Olympic sport fan, and that's not to disparage them or say that they don't matter or whatever else. But 
That's just not the kind of thing I follow that closely. I never really have. But I did see that bowling did not make uh, the Olympics. And I guess I don't know enough to be surprised or not, to be honest with you. But I did see that was true. Uh, Marshall Fleming says, I met fans from all over the country at games that just became fans from TV. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting, some of these stories about how who gets to where. Scotty Gorp says, I even root for horses with Georgia in their name. Well, there you go on that. Um, Keith Volt says, I live two hours away. I go to all home football games, some basketball games, some baseball, and I used to go to gymnastics. I took my daughter to a gymnastics meet a couple of years ago. And she still talks about it. Uh, she's six now. She'd been four back then. It was great. It was great fun. Now, I, I only understood about 9% of what was happening. I couldn't even really tell who was winning half the time. It's it, you know When you go and you haven't been before, it's a little bit confusing. But uh, it was a great time. My daughter just loved it. So if you ever get a chance to take your daughter or something like that to one of these gymnastics meets, you know they sell tickets pretty easily for those. It's not always the easiest thing to get tickets for. But if you get a chance to do that, it is really fun, really, really fun. Um, and it, I mean, obviously, what they're capable of doing is amazing, right? I mean, it's hard to believe that humans can do that, but uh, it, it's it's great entertainment. Uh, Bill Sanders says, Facebook police, hot on some folks' trail today. Yeah, I told you the other day, I, I, I just wrote something to Mickey Braddy and did it a long time ago, and I got this, like, spam message from Facebook over it. This, some of that stuff is so strange. Jamie Huff says, I went to all the football games until my son started playing travel football. And yeah, that's the issue that you deal with is obviously Saturdays in the fall for, you know, youth athletics is a pretty popular time. My kids haven't quite gotten into like the super busy Saturday stuff as of yet. I think my son may be on the verge of some of that now. He's nine. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that does have a big impact. You know, there, there are a couple of seasons of life, I think, where you're kind of less capable of just sort of being in Athens all the time. For me, like it was when I was in high school, you know, when I was the person that was doing the sports, it seems like I was less able to be in Athens for as many games as I kind of wanted to be. And then when you get old enough to have kids who are doing some of that kind of stuff, that's another season where you're kind of pulled away from that. But other than that, it's like, you know, child level, college level, you know, young adult level, older adult level. You know, that's when you kind of have more freedom to kind of be in Athens whenever you want to be. Eric Ray says, we live several hours from Athens and uh, live to, uh, love to go to a baseball game and gymnastic beat uh, on one weekend during the spring. Makes for a fun weekend. And you're right about that, Eric. Every now and then you get one of these perfect weekends where it's like there's G-Day and a big baseball series. Or there's, you know, like a, a basketball and a gymnastics and the same thing where you like get multiple sports kind of congregated at the same time. And there's obviously some scheduling configuration that has to be, it all has to sort of fall together to get that to take place. But you are kind of capable and able of doing that. And when you can make a weekend in Athens where you get multiple sports to enjoy, that can be really fun. Mark Strickland says UJ is an international uh, brand. I would agree with that. Daniel Aldrich says he's been repping the dog since he lived in Florida. Uh, Nick Roundtree. <laughs> Talking about giving the, uh, uh, the Golden Shoe Award to somebody. All right, let me do one more, two, one or two more on YouTube. We'll get ready to go. Uh, West Georgia dog fan. Talking about uh, SEC Media Days. Yeah, I think we're still looking... I mean, as you said, Kirby's obviously going to be there on that Tuesday. Sounds like you wouldn't mind attending. I think we're still kind of waiting to see just how wide open SEC Media Day is going to be. We know it's going to happen, but how wide open is it going to be in terms of fans in the lobby the way there used to be? I think we're still waiting to determine all that. Uh, Waiting to determine all that. Uh, Green Soldier says, uh, yeah, Media Day is back and it's – sort of original location in the Winfrey Hotel there in uh, in Hoover, Alabama. And, you know, there has been some – the one that got canceled was supposed to be in Nashville. Is that right? Oh, it's supposed to be – yeah, it's supposed to be in Atlanta. There, there, there's a Nashville uh, version of this event, I think, coming at some point in time. So I, I guess there is some travel for this event taking place 
uh, at some point. It was in Atlanta a couple of years ago. It's kind of a one-off, but uh, the event this year back at its traditional location there in uh, Hoover, Alabama at the Winfrey Hotel. And if you ever get a chance to go, it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, you don't get a chance to see very much of it, but you can be in the in the hallway there and, you know, see the coaches as they walk in. Uh, there's always a huge contingent for when Nick Saban's there, and that's kind of a thing to see. You know, I wouldn't go out of my way to go do it, but if it's an easy trip, an easy travel, when and there's a very good chance the fans aren't allowed this year because, as I said before, you're not quite so sure how open all that's going to be. But if you get a chance to do that, it's kind of an interesting thing to be able to see. Um. Cody Ledoux says he thinks that name, image, likeness is going to help USC, Texas, considering they have like 20 plus, uh, uh, you know, multi millionaires and several billionaires. Maybe so. I, I continue to believe, though, that as skeptical as I am about the big changes potentially on the horizon for college sports, the name, image, likeness thing, if I had to make a bet, I would bet you five years from now, 10 years ago, 10 years from now, I should say, ends up feeling smaller than some people think it's going to be as opposed to bigger. You know, there are just not that many people who are willing to, um, uh, there's just not that many people who are willing to kind of toss around a whole bunch of money. And like, you know, as I say all the time, for those of you that still watch commercials, watch TV, Watch how many commercials on TV actually have an athlete in them endorsing things. There's just not as many of those as you might think. There, you know, there are a few. Uh, speaking of John Collins, I see him on TV. He's got a couple of you know ads right now. A couple of the Braves, you know, have some of that there as well. But it's not like there's just an endless array of athlete endorsements on TV as it is. So that would be my kind of guess and prediction on all of that. Nonetheless, uh, we really appreciate you being here for our R.S. Andrews uh, cool down. Uh, appreciate that. Check them out online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They will show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised, the price that's promised for your air conditioning unit. If you're worried about that tired system making its way through the summer that's still to come, get some peace of mind by getting it tuned back up to Factory Fresh Specs online at rsandrews.com. You'll have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We will look forward to seeing you then, everybody. Dog Nation videos, check out youtube.com slash dog nation.